Welcome to the Heart of Innovation, 60 minutes that can save life and limb with new breakthrough ideas and innovation changing the healthcare landscape. Brought to you by patient advocacy group, thewaytomyheart.org. In partnership with Cardiovascular System Incorporated's patient advocacy campaign, Take a Stand Against Amputation. Here are your hosts for the Heart of Innovation, Emmy Award-winning journalist and founder of The Way to My Heart, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist and founder of the Save My Piggies Health Education Series, Dr. John Phillips. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. Dr. John Phillips literally just messaged me 10 minutes ago. He's on call at Ohio Health, and he has an emergent case that is just beginning. It's actually a heart case, which is quite ironic because I think that's where we're going with our conversation today. So joining me in that conversation, we have quite a few amazing people. We have a very special guest co-host, Dr. Mirzad Zarguni, interventional radiologist with Houston Vein and Vascular, who was named U.S. Vascular Doctor of the Year 2022 by the way to my heart. Hey, Dr. Zarguni, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, also here is nurse practitioner Kay Smith. Hi, folks. And nurse practitioner and CRNA, Catherine Walker, CEO of Revitalist, which is a group of mental health wellness centers in Tennessee, Kentucky, and a few other states. Hey, Catherine. Hey, thanks for having me. And we have dietitian Melissa Hooper, who's here. Hi, happy to be here. (laughs) And I'm doing this on purpose because I want you to get to know all of the voices. And we'll, of course, keep reminding you throughout the show. But we have a very special guest co-host. For the first time, we have a patient co-host with us. We have Pad Warrior Douglas, our Pad Warrior. um, You know, we always say Pad Warrior because... PAD stands for peripheral artery disease. That's how we got to know Douglas. It is a circulatory problem that's in mainly the legs, but three in five people who suffer a heart attack have peripheral artery disease. And actually today, ironically, um, we are actually talking about not his legs, but we are talking about his heart. He is joining us live from his hospital room in Houston, where he is on deck for open heart surgery following a stroke. He just is a true warrior who always inspires so many, and we wanted him to be with with us today. He volunteered. He jumped on. He was letting us know um, just before the show that he is scheduled. Aren't you, Douglas? You're you're now scheduled for your open heart, huh? It it looks like a a, a schedule for, for, for Wednesday. Yeah, and so we'll be talking to Douglas throughout Um, This show, it turns out that Catherine Walker is a former cardiac anesthesiologist. She is going to be sharing her perspective, allowing Douglas and others to ask questions of her. And even dietitian Melissa is here to be answering questions about the best cardiac diet to improve your health. But before we jump into the topic of the day, Kay, since Dr. Phillips isn't here, what is your inspirational quote? My quote is a quote that most people will be familiar with. It's from Hippocrates, which basically is a quote that everybody believes that most doctors say, and it ends with the words, do no harm. In actual fact, Hippocrates never actually said that. And it was added by Thomas Irwin at Oxford University in 1857. However, Hippocrates did say it in another lecture when he said, if you cannot do any good, first do no harm. But that is not part of the Hippocratic Oath. And only 57% of doctors nowadays qualifying actually take the Hippocratic Oath. Are you serious? Dr. Zarguni, did you know that? I did not know that, and I did not know Do Not Harm came from Oxford, but that's that's amazing to know. Thank you. <laughs> that is interesting. Um, well, Dr. Zarguni, thanks, Kay. Um, Dr. Zarguni, um, I, I think, is one of those people that literally, you know, he just abides by that do no harm. I mean, he is our vascular doctor of the year 2022 for the U.S. And actually, one of his patients is Douglas. And Dr. Zarguni, one of the reasons why you ended up with that designation and Douglas was one of the ones nominating you is because despite his complaints about his chest and several trips to the emergency room before, no one really did anything about his heart. You were the first person. Can you tell us what happened when he came to you actually to get his legs fixed and you said no? 
get to the hospital now. You need you need to see a heart doctor. So, yeah, so he uh, after we had done some work on him um, and I think at that point he was pretty much asymptomatic or cleared by cardiology. Uh, we decided to finish the rest of the uh, procedures on his leg at, at our office. When he presented that morning, he started having chest pain. He had uh, what we call arrhythmia, where the heart's not beating in a regular fashion. So we noticed that. And, you know, with the chest pain, you're thinking about either uh, an infarction or some pathologic process of the heart that we're dealing with. Uh, or electrical problem um, in that setting could happen. So, I mean, at that point, it's not safe to go to undergo an anesthesia or any procedure. So I had, um, at that point, we decided to call one of my uh, colleagues, one of the cardiologists, who uh, happened to be very smart and picked up what's what's going on with uh, Douglas. And we're very happy that we finally made his diagnosis. Um, Douglas can talk about it, but it's a very rare condition that we uh, collectively kind of figured out what's going on with them. Yeah, I think it was apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which I don't know if um, you or nurse practitioner Kay can explain kind of what that is. And you have to unmute. Apical hypertrophic um, cardiomyopathy is where the left ventricle and the atrium can become so full inside. So you can imagine there's a big space and the heart beats and squeezes the blood from the, the left ventricle into the right, the left atrium. But with Douglas, this space has become smaller and smaller and smaller to literally there's just a tiny wee space and that increases the pressure his blood pressure within his heart and it's trying desperately to squeeze the little bit of blood it can up to the atrium so that his circulation can keep going. Unfortunately, the atrium is now growing and it's blocking part of the valve between the two of them. So Douglas is going to have surgery. It's called a myomectomy. And basically they're going to shave back some of that extra tissue and allow his ventricle more space to be able to beat properly. And Douglas was just telling us that they actually might replace the valve between the ventricle and the atrium as well. So basically they're going to rebuild his heart. Right, but this is something that some people do in an interventional way. Why in this case is open better than the interventional procedure? Because a lot of times we always say, hey, minimally invasive is best. But in this case, it is not. Basically with Douglas, because it's been so invasive and because there is so much muscle growth within the, the ventricle and the atrium, if you to have abl the ablation where they use alcohol and the alcohol actually goes into the heart in, in a minimally invasive way, um, he would need multiple procedures. And it's a sort of hit and miss whether or not they're putting it into the right area or not. So they can't take the chance with Douglas. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it has to be open heart surgery and if they do the minimally invasive one it could take up to six months this operation that he's going to have he will feel the, the difference instantly thank you so much a nurse practitioner Kay Smith and coming up right here on the heart of innovation we'll actually let Douglas ask a few of our doctors and our nurse practitioners some questions about his upcoming procedure so stay with us Leg health can indicate risk for heart attack, stroke, and amputation. If you have leg pain or cramps while walking, get checked for peripheral artery disease, or PAD. PAD is plaque buildup in mainly the leg arteries. Be sure to ask your physician for an ankle brachial index, also called an ABI test, where they use blood pressure cuffs to analyze the blood pressure in your legs. If they discover you have arterial plaque that's limiting blood flow to your feet, medicine and a regimented walking program are frontline treatment. If PAD is in its advanced stages, your physician may schedule a surgical intervention. Minimally invasive tools are available to remove plaque and restore blood flow, including cardiovascular system's Diamondback 360 atherectomy system, which sands away plaque that is a hard calcium. It's important to discuss all options with your physician, and if told you have no options, get a second opinion. Take a stand against amputation. For more information, go to standagainstamputation.com. That's standagainstamputation.com. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. 
Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Mirzad Zarguni from Houston Vena Vascular. I'm actually filling, for, filling in for Dr. Phillips, who had an emergency case, probably saving a heart right now. So yes, he is. Before, before the break, we were kind of talking about the options, the treatment options, um, a minimally invasive procedure called ablation and an open heart sur- uh, surgery, um, in his case, in Douglas' case, uh, apical myomectomy and possibly a valve replacement. So one is invasive, one is minimally invasive. So that's where we left it off. Now, um, let's see what uh, Douglas's perspective is on this. What do you think about the options that you have and um, how, how do you think you want to approach it? In, 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 the, begin, in, in the beginning, it was like, I, I just wanted to go for the, the very last, the last, the, the full operation because I want to be I want to be done with it because the whole point is to get the graft out and this has to be done to be able to get to that part and when he was he gave me my options it was like I don't want to wait another six months I want to do it now but also at the same time it, 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 it when you think about open heart surgery and in the zipper club that you know to be honest it scared the holy you know what out of me in the beginning and, and I've been here a week now, and I've seen nine different doctors. And it's like each one has something that some, some, something to say. So it's like every now and then I, I told Kay I wanted a timeout. I need a timeout to let my brain catch up to – I'm thinking I'm Wednesday, you know, like with you, I wanted to ask you this. Wednesday, if it hadn't have been for you in that day, when you sent me to the hospital, I probably wouldn't be here right now where I'm at. And that's, that's, that's true. That's, that's true. Because yeah, you made the decision at that time to say, I don't need to keep going. I need, we need to take a different path. Take, take a different path. So it was like, how do, at what point do you as a doctor You know, I say that, you know, I, I I just saw this individual and he's from another you know, another doctor and, and, and all of that. And how do how do you process that with being am I, does that make sense? Right. Yeah, so right. How, yeah, how, if you have a different doctor and you are seeing someone, it's almost like. Are you cleaning up someone else's mess? How do you even get started? Is it, is it, or do you fear kind of that unknown that someone's already touched that patient? There's so much that goes into it when you get a new patient. So when I, when I see somebody in clinic or, you know, hospital or a procedure area, I mean, they're there to see you, right? So they've had their opinions, they had their physicians and they've had different approaches and they're there to listen to your opinion. And, you know, it, goes back to what Kay said, do not harm, right? So you want to do what's best for the patient. And at that moment, you know, there, there are different approaches to the same problem. You know, you could take um, A to B or A, C to B, and it goes to the same path. But at some point, if the other paths are really not working for the patient or they're not the correct way, you have to step in and kind of, you know, um, squeeze the arm of the other physicians maybe at some point or or redirect the whole process and i think with douglas when we saw what was going on with his heart i mean we had to get help to redirect the process and sometimes that redirection comes with collaboration uh from different specialties and you have to kind of be there up front and uh, educate the patient because at, at the end of the day it's douglas who's going to make all of this happen we're just here to help him. And I think but what I loved is that you ended up not just blindly saying, go to the emergency room. You got on the phone with one of your friends, your fellow colleagues and said, hey, here's the patient. Here's what I know. Please help him. And actually, his care was expedited in that hospital because of you making that phone call. And that was really huge. You didn't have to do that. You could have just sent him to the emergency room. But the fact that you literally picked up the phone 
was a really big deal. It made the biggest difference for him. Well, I appreciate it. And then by the same token, um, his doctor, his heart doctor, Kay and I were on the phone with Douglas and his doctor the other day, and he said he actually wanted your phone number so he could call you to find out if there's any complications that could arise because of the vascular problems in Douglas's legs. So when he does the heart, could there be anything that could go awry? And I thought that was amazing as well, that no one's having these big egos here and trying to just own a patient. They're sharing the patient. They're being collaborative for the patient's sake. You don't see that all the time, surprisingly. And that's, honestly, that's the best way to treat patients and treat, you know, especially a complex patient like Douglas is a complex man and he's got he a is. complex problem. <laughs> So, you know, you have to be collaborative. You have to put the ego down and you have to put the politics away and, and work together. And we have uh, Catherine Walker here, who's a nurse practitioner, and she's also the CEO of Revitalist over in, um, they have mental wellness um, treatment centers over in Tennessee, Kentucky, et cetera. But she also is a former cardiac anesthesiologist and is very familiar with this this area. I know that Douglas had mentioned the Zipper Club and and such. Can you, and you said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know what that is. Can you kind of explain a little bit more there? We have less than two minutes left, and then we can get into more detail in the next segment. I'll be I'll be quick. Um, so yeah, so the zipper club is um, where they'll actually do a sternotomy. So they'll actually cut Douglas's chest, right? His uh, chest plate kind of in the front there of his chest. Um, so they they cut that, and then they um, they used to Douglas. So you know they used to always use staples. That was your zipper, um, but now fortunately they can use. They have wires, but they also have plates. So it depends on what your surgeon will use. Um, but typically they glue people now. So it's it's a it's a zipper, but the you don't have to see the the staple marks anymore, right? So it's a little bit cleaner. Um, so that that's the part of that. And then two, I'll say with Dr. Zarguni's piece with interventional radiology and working with cardiologists. In the hospitals, we're very much used to working more on a collaborative manner and asking each other's help and assistance. It's in the outpatient world where they become very territorial. Um, they don't speak to each other in the outpatient world. So just having those specialists internally is, is a great thing. And, and as Douglas knows, it really was to his benefit. That's interesting because um, Dr. Zarguni is an on-office-based lab as well, but he also has it. Um, what are they, just hospital privileges? And so it's really good to have and maintain those ties as he has done, which is also why he has been our go-to doctor um, for the way to my heart um, for a couple of years now. Now, coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation, we're going to let Douglas actually jump in and um, ask uh, Nurse Practitioner Walker a couple of questions possibly about that procedure based on her experience. So you don't want to miss that. Stay with us. my symptoms started with leg pain and leg cramps while walking. Me too, with a tightness in my calves. Well, do you know, my doctor thought that my leg cramps were a side effect of the statin he prescribed me. Well, my doctor just brushed them off as another symptom of old age. Mine thought the pain was radiating from my spine. My doctor blamed my neuropathy on diabetes until I got a wound on my foot that just wouldn't heal. Yeah, it turns out we all have peripheral artery disease, also known as PAD. It's plaque buildup mainly in the leg, arteries causing poor circulation. For me, the diagnosis came too late and I lost my leg, but that does not have to happen to you. No, it does not because there are treatment options available if you're diagnosed early enough. PAD. Peripheral artery disease. If you've been experiencing leg pain, leg cramps, or neuropathy when walking, and your doctor isn't hearing you, we are. We are the way to my heart, the largest support network for peripheral artery disease patients. And we want to help you get back on your feet again. Visit our website at thewaytomyheart.org or call our LegSaver hotline, 415-320-7138. Your life and limb could depend on it. Welcome back to the Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Good 
Welcome back to the show. We have Dr. Zarguni that's here. We have nurse practitioner Kay. We have a patient, Douglas, who is preparing for open heart surgery. We have nurse practitioner Catherine Walker, who is here. And she has a lot of experience as a former cardiac uh, anesthesiologist. And she's also in mental health with mental wellness centers called Revitalist over in Tennessee, Kentucky, and more. Uh, Douglas, um, is you know on edge waiting for his procedure so we have Catherine who's going to walk him through but also talk about really quickly the mental preparation going into it as well yeah so douglas i'm going to walk you through all this and then if you have questions you can ask um but this is something to where in the hospital system we are around so much cardiac right when, when you do cardiac that's your specialty it's your everyday bread and butter um so we kind of lose the feeling that Others don't know necessarily what's all going on. So we just kind of, you know, we do our tasks, and, but we don't always think about your mental health along the way and how are you handling it? Because most people look fine, even though, in you know, internally they may not feel fine. So on the day of your surgery, um, typically they'll get you down to the operating room to pre-op. So that's where they get you all prepped. They'll get you down two hours before your surgery starts at a minimum. So if you're at 8 a.m. or 7 a.m., they'll get you down around 5 a.m., 6 a.m. So it's always an early morning. So you go down there, um, they will put IVs in you. So typically you'll have an IV in your neck and then you'll have two normal IVs in your arms, one on each side typically, and then they'll have another line there called an arterial line, which helps us to measure your blood pressure. So you're going to feel all lined up. You're going to be very, they're very pretty with colors. There's yellows That's and red. Scary. Isn't that to see yourself and it, you're awake right during this time to have someone put an IV in your neck. That's not something that we experience every single day. Right. And there's and it, a and lot it, there it, it's a lot. Yeah, it's very overstimulating. So hopefully your anesthesia provider will be great and explain everything to you. And, and the pre-op nurses are wonderful. Typically, they'll they'll try to inform you as much as possible. They use numbing medicine um, prior to the IV in your neck and then prior to the arterial line. Um, so that helps a lot. And then a lot of times they'll give you some medicine in the pre-op area to help with the anxiety as well. So that helps. So they get you all pretty with your lines. And the reason we have those lines is because we want to make sure that we're monitoring monitoring every aspect of pressure changes with your heart to make sure that you're as safe as possible. So that's the reason for that. Um, they'll have you on the monitors in the pre-op area. Typically the surgeon will come in, they'll speak to you, they'll make sure that everything's good. Um, anesthesia will ask you a whole bunch of questions about yourself that you feel like they probably should already know, but they really like to hear it from you first, um, just to verify that. And then the, the heart team, once you're ready, the heart team will come get you and they'll take you back. So when they take, come and take you back, typically your anesthesia provider let me know if they're not but they're usually really really good and they're usually comforting and they'll bring some medications as well to help out um, with just the memory aspect because we know how stressful it is so you go into the operating room we get you off to sleep and then you're not going to remember anything else um, until you wake up so your surgery takes place um, and then after your surgery's over they take you to icu you're on a breathing machine. Typically, you'll stay on the breathing machine. You won't know any of this is going on because we don't want to increase the stress on your heart. We want to keep your heart exactly where it needs to be. Not too low, not too high, but just perfect. And then when you're ready to come off the breathing machine, then they'll take you off. And typically, that's anywhere from on average three hours. Some people are six hours. Some people are a little bit longer, um, but we keep you on medicine. It might be a couple days. Yeah, the same three to five days. On the, on the breathing machine? Yeah, then we might get the graft as well. Okay. So, so yeah, so they, the graft is this axillobifemoral bypass graft. It is a graft that reroutes blood flow from the shoulder and the axillo artery clear down and it, it splits off into the legs at the groin to reroute blood flow around uh, blockages in the aortic area. And for Douglas, that graft has blocked. And that's where Dr. Zarguni went in and he bypassed the bypass and was able to re uh, restore blood flow to his legs. So this graft they're talking about also taking out when they go in to do the open heart surgery. Okay. All right. So a little more involved and that's okay, Douglas. Um, but you'll be on the breathing machine and they'll keep you on medicine that keeps you very comfortable. Um, and, the, and, and the pain pain aspects too. So the biggest piece that I've learned where I worked in the ICU for so long is when you're on the breathing machine, and this is the scariest piece, this is mind over matter here. Um, but when you're on the breathing machine, we put something down, your 
throat into your lungs to, to help you to breathe the best, right? It's your endotracheal tube. It feels like you're breathing with a straw, a big straw, but a straw. So it's not taking a big deep breath. It's taking a pursed lip breath. So when you purse lip breathe, you know, when you're kind of like that, that's the piece where you really it's mind over matter. So if you learn to do that previously before, you know, going to sleep, you'll wake up, you're like, oh, okay, this is exactly what Katie said. This is the way it feels. I'm okay. Kind of thing. So there's a lot of self reassurance there and just trust knowing that these people, it's not their first rodeo. Um, so after they get you off the breathing machine, whenever you're ready, um, then the scariest part. So as you mentioned about being gutted like a fish, it's not cardiac anesthesia or cardiac surgery is actually, a, 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 it's a pretty beautiful thing per se, and it's not very bloody. So, um, but when that happens, um, with that piece, it's not painful. It's that you have to, um, there's not nerve receptors around your sternum. You just have to support yourself a little bit more. So sometimes they'll give you a heart pillow or they'll give you a little bit of a, um, supportive device and that helps you to support that so that's the biggest piece is to support that for at least six weeks because you want to give that bone time to heal so hopefully that helps to ask or answer some of the questions but then we can um coming up on the next segment we can ask some additional questions thank you so much katie coming up next right here on the heart of innovation we actually have our save my piggies segment and then we'll have more with douglas and our doctors and nurse practitioners again on heart surgery coming up later on in the show so stay with us Medical Notepad brought to you by The Way to My Heart in partnership with Cardiovascular Systems Incorporated's advocacy campaign, Take a Stand Against Amputation. Hi, I'm Kim McNicholas, CEO of The Way to My Heart. And today's Medical Notepad is focused on how to choose a vascular specialist to treat and or manage peripheral artery disease or PAD, which is a chronic circulatory problem in mainly the leg arteries. While your referring physician may only know to send you to a vascular surgeon, it's not the only practice that treats PAD. Interventional cardiologists and interventional radiologists may also treat PAD. It's important to always get a second or even a third opinion across practices to weigh all available options. Why? Different doctors have different tools, different techniques, and different philosophies in treating PAD. But most will tell you they have conviction in the options they offer. But while they may have valid options, they may not be the most advanced options available and the right options for you, depending on your personal presentation of disease and your definition of a better quality of life. How do you know if your vascular specialist has advanced skills for saving limbs, or should I say limb salvage? As a PAD advocate for The Way to My Heart, which provides high-touch advocacy for patients, I consider the vascular specialists who are known by their peers as CLI fighters advanced skilled, meaning the ones most likely to exhaust all available options to prevent amputation. A CLI fighter is trained in treating the most complex stage of peripheral artery disease known as critical limb ischemia, or CLI. This is where blockages are the toughest to tackle and time is ticking to save not just the tissue and nerves from dying, but the entire foot or leg. You know you are in the CLI stage if the pain and cramping wakes you up at night and or you have a non-healing wound on your foot or toe. My thought is, if someone has the skills to save limbs in complex cases such as these, then it's more likely that they have an advanced skill set. I always ask questions first about their minimally invasive skills. Those are telling because those are the ones that I would consider advanced skills, the advanced interventional skills, the ones that may involve a small puncture to slip wires, balloons, plaque removal devices, and even stents into the arteries under x-ray guidance. It's a procedure known as an angiogram. My top five questions about advanced skill set actually begin with, One, do you treat small vessels below the knee and into the foot using wires and balloons? For advanced limb salvage, a highly skilled physician knows how to navigate clear to the toes in a minimally invasive way, if medically appropriate or necessary. Those who can't say it should never be done. 
Number two, I ask about how they access the arteries. They can puncture the artery in the arm or groin and tackle the blockage coming down from above, which is called an antegrade approach. Or they can come up from below with a puncture in the calf or foot, known as a retrograde approach. Most doctors access the leg arteries through a puncture in the groin area, but if they aren't able to get through the blockage coming down from the groin, a CLI fighter will have the ability and willingness to attempt through a puncture in the foot or calf. Number three, I ask about additional imaging they use beyond the x-ray in order to better visualize the vessel during the angiogram. More specifically, do they use intravascular ultrasound known as IVIS? Although some physicians claim it's an unnecessary additional cost, advanced skilled specialists are able to use it to better understand the type of plaque they're facing, as well as to more accurately size and place balloons and stents. Number four, what is the physician's success rate in crossing the most complex blockages known as chronic total occlusions or CTOs? And number five, if the blockages are too complex for a wire and balloon, do they have options for using grafts to bypass the blockages or can they manually scrape out the blockages known as an endarterectomy? They don't have to perform those invasive procedures themselves, but they do have to have a strong referral network to a surgeon who can do those procedures if medically necessary. Here's a bonus one. If all else fails and you are on deck for amputation due to the lack of blood flow into the foot, does the physician know how to perform or can he or she refer you to someone who can perform what's called a deep vein arterialization or DVA, where they reroute blood flow from an artery to a vein to restore that blood flow into your foot? Now, I know this is not an exhaustive list of questions, but these ones do give some indication as to whether or not a physician is continuing to stay on the cutting edge of treatment for PAD. If you want to learn more, call the Wade to My Heart's Leg Saver Hotline at 415-320-7138. With this week's Medical Notepad, I'm Kim McNicholas, CEO of the Way to My Heart. Medical Notepad is brought to you by the Way to My Heart, in partnership with Cardiovascular Systems Incorporated's advocacy campaign, Take a Stand Against Amputation. Remember that the advice and views offered are for educational and informational purposes only. Do not act on any information provided here without the explicit consent of your own healthcare team. For more PAD education, go to standagainstamputation.com. And for real-time support, go to thewaytomyheart.org. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. This is uh, Dr. Zargoni filling in for Dr. Phillips. I'm an interventional radiologist in Houston. We want to welcome you to a little segment called Save my little piggies. And here we're lucky to have Marsha, a patient, and Dr. Coral, who is an interventional cardiologist from Christ Hospital in Cincinnati. So um, let's uh, start with Marsha. And can you tell us a little bit about how you found Dr. Coral and what were your symptoms and why did you get, uh, why did you seek help for your uh, symptoms? Yeah. So um, last summer, I had not been feeling well for for a long time, but last summer it really came to a head where I was out walking in my garden. I'm a gardener, and um, I didn't know what it was, but it was classic claudication. Um, And I had a long wait to get in with my new doctor, but when I did, I told her, um, I think it was in March, that, you know, I was having a hard time walking, and but when I sat down, it, it got better. And when I walked again, it would come back. And she said it sounded like classic claudication and peripheral artery disease and that I should just walk more. And at that point, I started researching everywhere. And thank God I found Kim McNicholas. And um, 
She said that where I live, I really had two choices to go see Dr. Coral or John Phillips because they were about equal distances away from me. And I chose Dr. Coral and they got me in right away, which was terrific. And the rest is history. He's fixed me up. He's my miracle man. So yeah, I messaged Dr. Coral, actually, I messaged Dr. Coral on Twitter and I was like, oh my gosh, he's responding, Marsha, he's responding. And he jumped I'm right so in to help her. Perfect. Dr. Coral, can you kind of tell us about how you approach a patient, how um, you approach claudication, and um, how do you treat these patients? Yeah, so good question. Uh, first of all, I appreciate you guys having me on the show. Um, great honor. So. We'd like to treat the whole patient, obviously. And, um, you know, with Marsha, she came to see me for the first time in May, late May, had classic claudication symptoms, as she described. She also had some risk factors with the cholesterol and some tobacco history, et cetera. So we adjusted some medications. Uh, she had an abnormal ABI, non invasive test already with the right ABI of 0.49. So we set her for an angiogram uh, to better identify her anatomy. Uh, went right radial approach with the access, the took risk. a picture through the wrist, correct. We've, we uh, try to avoid femoral access if possible, but sometimes uh, right it's necessary. Yes. So we um, took a picture of both legs. We found a severe stenosis in her left external iliac, which we treated at that time with a self-expanding stent. The rest of her left leg looked pretty good down the ankle. We imaged the right leg and she had a severe stenosis in her right external iliac and a chronic total occlusion extending her whole right SFA. Yeah, uh, she with distal some and via cleft. Yeah, she had some blockages. We did treat the left side initially on that um, uh, procedure. She was having some discomfort in the arm with some spasm. Um, so we were able to treat that right side. We brought her back about a month later in July and we went in the left groin up and over treated that external iliac, and then we were able to cross that chronic total occlusion using distal access, tibial access um, coming up through. We did put a short self-expanding stent at the proximal cap and a, and a stent distally and treated the right, middle with- Right, that's the top uh, of the blockage. Correct. And a stent, stent is a metal scaffold that keep, helps keep the vessels open that are blocked completely. Yep. Yes, correct. And we had some recoil proximally and distally, which is common in these chronic total occlusions with, with calcified caps and treated the middle section, long middle section with a drug coated balloon. And of course, we use intravascular ultrasound and, and size the vessel appropriately and got a really nice result. And uh, thus far, it's been a durable result with a lot of symptom relief. Yeah, it's great. You walked us through really, you know, how how these procedures really work, you know, from being able to properly get the right imaging. We tell patients and Marsha knows one of the questions I think she even asked you was, do you use intravascular ultrasound? Because she said that came back to me. She's like, he uses it. I said, I know he uses it. It just allows doctors to um, get a better idea of what type of plaque is there and to properly size those balloons and stents, which is, is very, very helpful and reduces the chance of having to do the procedure again because the vessels um, are not treated properly in the first place. But Marsha, um, you know, how did you feel before and then after? Because I see you are out hiking. It seems like you have new legs. I feel like I have new legs. I feel like I have a new life. I quit smoking. I uh, my cholesterol and triglycerides have just have you know dropped tremendously. Um, I was pre diabetic. I switched that around, so I went really hardcore on everything. Quit smoking. I think I mentioned that, and. Even through claudication, I got up to where I was doing 15, 16,000 steps a day before surgery. And about a week before, I thought, I just can't do this. Not another day it, because it hurt so bad. Um, but I built great collaterals, I think, because I was um, I was determined. And uh, but now post-surgery, I mean, it didn't take long at all. I had a little mishap that I kind of was a set pack with um not anything dr pearl did but after that subsided I, I now can hike eight nine miles a day and uh i'm doing great it's completely pain-free and i want to walk more and my friends are all calling me for us because of the 
the uh, part in Forrest Gump where they, they said, run, force, run, and he just took off. Is so this normal, Dr. Carl, to have... Is it normal, Dr. Curl, to have such a compliant um, patient such as Marsha to be able to literally, come after the procedure, get out there and just run, run, run? Yeah, that's a great question. She is the perfect patient. I mean, first of all, she's oh, nice perfect. and pleasant and all those good things, but uh, completely compliant, completely motivated, quit smoking, which is uh, honestly more for her it does more benefit for her than i have ever done for her so that's probably the biggest thing she's done for herself and uh, it's great to see you know the uh, the motivation and the uh, commitment to keep going so um, she's the perfect patient she is a good human too in the last 10 seconds marcia what is um it what is it like to be a good human well, oh i don't know about that i i am not a good human i i give out awards for good humans though exactly exactly <laughs> but you're a good human yourself and you honor those that are also good humans thanks so much marcia for joining us dr coral and we'll be right back with more the heart of innovation welcome back to the heart of innovation for more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist, Dr. John Phillips. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Dr. John Phillips is on call at Ohio Health with an emerging uh, situation with a heart patient. Um, speaking of heart patients, we have... Uh, Patient with us right now, we have Douglas, who is on deck for open heart surgery on Wednesday, and we've been talking about his situation and getting his questions and also hoping to ease his fears, as well as any of you who have open heart surgeries, such as what he is going into next week. And we want to ease your fears as well. Douglas, do you have a final question that you want to ask of any one of our panel today? The, the big question is about a uh, uh, di diet is what I'm going to have to make some big changes when I wake up and walk out of the hospital. And, and, and what are some of the good ways and bad ways of doing it? Hey, Dietitian Melissa is here. Dietitian yeah. Melissa. Um, hi, Melissa. Thanks for joining hi. us. Hi, thanks for having me. And um, I know it's a very short amount of time left here, but um, I have worked on a lot of the post-cardiac drastic surgery floor and with patients who had congestive heart failure and, and myocardial infarctions. So the three main things I would say is it's the cholesterol, it's the fats, and it's the sugars. And without knowing a lot else about Douglas's medical history, um, those would be the main ones to focus on. So reducing your amount of animal product intake for meats and also the saturated fats and the hydrogenated fats that, you know, to reduce those with, you know, and if not eliminate them from your cooking, um, using more of the, you know, cold pressed olive oils um, and eating more avocados, things like that. Those are going to have what's called mono and saturated fats that help lower your bad cholesterol and raise your good cholesterol through your diet. Um, and then, you know, we did talk a little bit about um, the previous patient who had diabetes. Diabetes does typically go hand in hand with cardiovascular disease sometimes, but um, the sugars will also raise your triglycerides, which is another big component of the cholesterol panel. So those would be the main three that I would say to focus on. Okay, Douglas, no more Dr. Pepper Slurpees. <laughs> uh, apparently, yeah. <laughs> lucky stop. That's going to. I'm gonna have to cut that out. So, how would we reach? How how can we reach you to help us figure that out? Yeah, you can um, find me at www.dietitianmelissa.com, and that's spelled with two T's. It's D I E T I T I A N Melissa M E L I S S A dot com. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dietitian Melissa. We really appreciate you. And hopefully in the future, we'll have more time and we can, I'm sure we have lots of questions on diet. Um, Douglas, we want to wish you the best going into this procedure, you know, big procedure. We appreciate you joining us. So many people are learning so much from your experience and it takes such courage for you to come on and share your experience um, with everyone um, right now. It, it's, it's really, you already have inspired us and this even more today in, in sharing your story. So thank you so much. We'll have to, we'll have to maybe add, cause how does this relate to PAD? Because they do, cause if we know some things that Kay goes through, 
that the PAD affects diabetes, lupus, and all of that. So PAD just doesn't affect one area. Look at what it encompasses. Right. You know, you have your body's like this human superhighway, right, Dr. Z, in, in the last 10 seconds, um, you know, of the show here. It's it, everything's connected. And if you have problems with your legs, you got to get your heart checked. If you have problems with your heart, get your legs checked. If you have any of those, get your neck checked, those arteries there. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll have more next week on The Heart of Innovation. So thank you, you so much and have a the great heart week. Of innovation with Emmy Award winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phil. Our mission is to help patients live a better quality of life through comprehensive education, real-time support, and high-touch advocacy in partnership with thewaytomyheart.org and take a stand against amputation. Our purpose is to reduce the 1.5 million heart attacks and strokes and nearly 200,000 amputations annually. For more information regarding topics you've heard discussed on today's program, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. The Heart of Innovation is for educational and informational purposes only, and advice and views shared are not a substitute for medical advice from your own supervising physician. Do not act on any information provided in this show without the explicit consent from your own healthcare team. If you think you are having a medical emergency, call your local emergency number or go to the nearest hospital or emergency room.